So if you start your day looking at your phone and your text messages, you're probably going to get anxiety. <laughs> what? I don't know how many people first thing in the morning open up their phone and they're like, oh, <laughs> life is so good. Hi, I'm Kelsey Humphreys and this is The Pursuit where I help you in your journey, your hustle, and your climb to be your best self and put out your best work. After all, I'm still hustling for that too, guys. So I sit down and interview today's most successful celebrities, executives, and entrepreneurs, and I break down success for the rest of us. This is a Pursuit Profile episode. While you may not know Mike Bayer's name, you need to hear his story. He is a personal development coach and a mental health and addiction counselor on a mission to explain to the world that mental health and emotional health are important for everyone, not just those in recovery. You may have heard that he's a sober companion or a recovery manager, or that he's on tour with Demi Lovato. All are true. He's the CEO of Cast Centers, a clinic and network of professional support, and has served as a sober companion and life coach to many celebrities. Before founding Cast, he had his residency at the Hazelden Foundation and then spent five years becoming one of the leading interventionists in the country. Soon he was bringing in more clients organically than were being assigned to him, and he decided to go out on his own and found Cast. Recently, Demi Lovato invited him on tour with her to facilitate pre-show wellness seminars for the performers themselves and a few hundred concert goers. If you're interested in building a business helping others as a life coach, therapist, or counselor, you will love these keys to success from my interview with Mike Bayer. Kind of take us back. You started, I mean, you're most well known because you are the life coach, I guess, to Demi Lovato and some other stars. So that's probably how you've seen him. Uh, online and heard his name, but you decided that you wanted to go into counseling and help people change their lives when you were 22, which is pretty young. So tell us how that came about. Well, that came about from uh, being a hot mess when I was younger. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, when I got sober, you know, I, I always was driven and, and, and motivated, but the, the addiction and alcoholism just kind of kept me from being the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. So when I got sober at 22, I worked at a rehab called Hazelden. I interned there and then I worked at a bunch of other uh, treatment centers. But I mean, I had no money. I would count <laughs> the pennies to buy a sandwich. I worked at coffee shops, like <laughs> just hustling, right? Yep. yep. Kind of like what you guys are. Uh, mm -hmm. Bootstrapping. Right, right. And um, eventually I got a job as an interventionist. 24. Wow. And that was kind of a, a big move in my career. And I flew around the country doing hundreds of interventions, which were you an employee or out on your own? I was an employee. Okay. So I opened up the West coast office for, uh, at that time it was a really big intervention company. Um, and then really quickly I kind of built my own business out of that. And I started seeing clients in my apartment in Venice. Okay. So let's pause. Now, if someone who's watching that has been through something mm -hmm. and they decide they want to help, how do you know when you're ready? I actually just talked to someone yesterday. People, since I'm now sober, people tell me their stories and, you know, she's like, now I want to become an advocate. How do you know when you're ready to transition when you've healed and you can do that? Hmm. Gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I, well, I feel like, um, you have to be honest with yourself. Mm hmm I think for me, it's when, when I realized that it wasn't about my story, mm -hmm. that it's about how do I help the other person Yeah. and work, working through my own issues. So I'm not projecting, which means my own childhood issues and traumas are going to somehow get in the way of helping someone. Right. So once you're a clean slate, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're ready to start helping. So now you're hustling, getting all these side jobs. How did you land that important interventionist job I mean they basically one day I was studying for the MSW mm -hmm. which is uh, GRE which is to get I was applying for all these different colleges was gonna get my master's in social work I always had this vision of creating programs that could help everyone because the industry of mental health is so niche mm -hmm. and I was living in Minnesota driving my Mercury Sable that, nice. that was shipped out from LA by my parents. And, um, and that day that I was, I did the Princeton review. I was all, you know, I've never been a good test taker. I've, I've never thrived in the education system. 
And that day my car wouldn't start. And I don't know why, I just had this moment of like, why am I going to go back to school again? Mm -hmm. And it was weird. I just, I didn't show up for the test. And the next day someone um, reached out to me and said they were looking for someone to open up their West Coast office. Wow. Yeah. So just trusting your gut a little bit. Right. Awesome. Now, so now you're traveling, you're doing your interventionist work. When did you know you were ready to go out on your own? I knew I was ready to go on my own when uh, the company I was working for wasn't, uh, I was providing more value to them mm-hmm. than they were to me in a real way. Not in like, uh, and I totally appreciated what they had done for me because they right. helped, helped me build up some confidence. But um, I went back to the owner of the business, which to this day probably regrets not. Because I just said, look, you know, at the time, that company, um, they'd give you a percent. Mm. So if I go do an intervention for, you know, $5,000, they would give uh, 25%. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then if I brought in the intervention myself, they would give like 35%. Okay. But eventually what happened was I was bringing in all this business. And so it just didn't make sense and they wouldn't change the percentages. So I just took the jump, took Mm -hmm. a leap of faith. Um, And through that time, I've created a lot of different businesses in the mental health industry. Some have been really successful. Some haven't worked quite out, you know, worked out right. the way I wanted to. Um, but then I just, I, I moved uh, up to Los Angeles from Orange County and and just kind of put my stake mm. in the ground as I'm Mike there and I'm, I'm an interventionist, you okay. know. Okay. So uh, what do you think was the success to getting it, getting all the, like, you know, you were bringing them more value. How did you have that draw of clients? I think what I did is I looked at, and this is any industry. Mm-hmm. You go into any industry fresh, young, hungry, mm-hmm. and you see these other people that have been doing it for 25 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. And they seem to be like they kind of run things. Mm-hmm. But every business is based on relationships. And so I would look at it. I would try to learn as much as possible about the industry I was in. So at that time, I'd visit every single rehab. Rehabs, I wouldn't even send me business because I knew if... if The more educated I was, um, while these other people have been in the business for years, they weren't doing that anymore. They probably hadn't visited these programs in five or 10 years. And, um, and I fit a niche. I mean, if someone had a a son or daughter, they wanted someone probably in their twenties, not in their sixties. Right, right, right. And, um, and so, yeah, that was kind of how I, so then you go out on your own. I did. That's when a lot of people fail. So mm-hmm. talk about the hustle to build that business and get clients in when you're now solo. Um, gosh, building the client. Well, I had a lot of, I made a lot of friends. You know, I've always had the philosophy of work with people you love, even to this day. So if I don't love working with someone or really enjoy it or we have great chemistry, it doesn't matter if I'm going to get more business from another resource or person I really focus on the chemistry of the people I love working with and from my experience I'm a big believer in the universe and energy and Mm -hmm. good things happen if your intention's right yeah and um so that's kind of how I just built everything Mm -hmm. you know I would uh and I would do my part to just help people as much as possible. So I became a resource. Mm-hmm. I became an expert. Because once, even in any industry, it's one thing to, a lot of people just want to look at, okay, well, I just want to make money based upon the service line I provide. Mm-hmm. Um, what I found is if I was a resource for anyone looking for help, I could refer, I could mm-hmm. collaborate, yeah. I could, and my name would be on the radar a lot more. So. Yeah. For me, I just wanted to be the best possible resource in my industry. Great advice. So then kind of talk us through how you decided, you know, you're, you're a solo operation and now you have cast centers and mm-hmm. you have celebrity clients. So did you decide, did you have a vision that you were going to scale that big? Well, what I, what I did was first, so I'm in my fourth office now. Hmm. My first office, we would run like one group a week. So it, and it was more addiction focused and mm-hmm. it was this you know, dingy, beat up <laughs> office. And I was like, how am I going to afford this? Mm-hmm. Like, gosh, it's, it was, I think it was 1200 a month. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> gosh, it's a big risk. Right. And, and then I, um, you know, we kept upgrading. Then I created, I created this business called black sheep, 
web technologies, which I employed people who had more acute mental health issues mm. and thinking that if I created jobs, mm -hmm. the problem was it was an impossible business to monetize. If you have people who really don't want to work oh, yeah. and you have a web company, <laughs> it doesn't quite work out right. concept I love, <laughs> but like, you know, we were suddenly paying people to create art of black sheep on a wall and just, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't working out, but, um, then the office, you know, two offices ago had no windows, hmm. you know, and, right. and I'm competing with these people who have massive funding, who have household names. Right. And, and what happened was, um, I, it just kept growing. It just kept, hmm. we, our focus has been, how do we take care of somebody? How do we, and, and also for my business, what I found is do not take anyone that we truly believe we can't help. Mm. because it it's bad for the person right you're not we're not being helpful it's bad for uh, other clients in our program yeah. and, and and what ha what happens is if I help someone who which a lot of the programs in my industry I would say they say they treat everyone mm -hmm. right they yeah. work with everyone and what happens is you can actually a you can do more harm and you can create the story for a person that like rehab doesn't work for me treatment doesn't work for me oh, no right. they just ended up at the wrong center yeah. that's got to be hard i feel like there's probably people watching who are consultants or life coaches or they feel bad turning someone away who has a problem how do you no i don't i think it's connecting with the right resource okay because then you become a trusted resource so you're not turning them away you're turning them to a better yeah place. like if if uh you know I, that's like saying a developer should know how to do graphic design. Hmm, right. You know, just because it's one industry specific, it's like find the best possible match for your client and you'll know when it's the right match for you. Yeah. You know, I think that's how I've done everything. But what about when you start to grow? It's not you personally anymore. So mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about people who are, you know, solo and then you start to hire other people to oh, do yeah. what you were doing all your own. I mean, I used to have twice as many staff as I have now. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I expanded quickly. I opened up a lot of um, sober living homes. I had a women's house, a men's house. I had an uh, apartment building. I had mm -hmm. um, a big outpatient center. And the quality wasn't as great as I wanted. Mm -hmm. So then I stripped it all back and uh, went back to the roots of like, what are we doing to help people? Yeah. And then eventually I got, you know, most recently I'd say in the last three years, we've gotten out of addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, we treat people with addictions, but the type of client we treat is someone that's motivated to be a better person or a better version of themselves. Mm. So really for us, mental health is everyone. It's me, it's you. Yeah. It's everyone. It's how do we become better? Mm -hmm. And so how did you start getting celebrity clients? Gosh, wow. well, yeah, I live in LA. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess that's a big part of it. <laughs> and it was, I had had a few, like, my, I, so I had a few celebrity clients where I'd end up in the Hollywood Hills and these big houses. And, you know, you hear the footsteps when you walk in. I was young and I was like, oh, wow, you know. Um, and then I would say a lot of the, I guess you would say higher profile, which always is just a strange <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because everyone's the same. Mm -hmm. Um is I got a call that somebody uh, wanted a sober companion. So we have companions who travel with people all over the world. And um, and uh, it, it ended up being Demi Lovato. And that was, I want to say, five and a half, six, almost, almost six years, I think. And um, she, she's a success story. And um, she... I mean, has vocalized how myself and her manager have saved her life, which really, right. she saved her own life. Mm -hmm. um, we just brought in our own systems and team to, to, to help her. Um, and, you know, I was just at the concert with her last night in uh, Anaheim. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll see her today in San Jose. And she's just become a, you know, she is the modern day Betty Ford. Mm. And 
I would never have guessed that, again, it comes down to like, my intention is how do I help someone? Right. You know, and even till recently, I never would talk about Demi. I've been a very behind the scenes guy. Uh, in my own Evolve, it's been a feeling of, okay, if I start mentioning clients who are fine with it, who have <laughs> talked about me, right. that somehow I won't be trusted, right. that somehow I'm, it's all about my own self-interest and how I've grown my business is about it being about their interests. Mm. So until recently when Demi's just kind of, Demi's the one who's like, Mike, you should be, a lot of people have their like, you should do interviews, you should talk, you should spread the message of what's going on and everything. Um, and that's why I'm on your show. Yeah. How did you get through that mental block? I think a lot of people have trouble, you know, really just going out there and talking about what they do and it feels self promoting Um, I think, and this is something I took away from Demi because I asked, you know, we're, we're on tour with her right now. So we do a self empowerment hour before the concert starts. Mm -hmm. It's called cast on tours. It's amazing. Yeah. So awesome. Fires me up. <laughs> There's no business model behind it, again, and that hasn't been. You know, a lot of people are into like business plans, business models. For me, again, it's just about how do I create the best experience for the tour and for the fans. About and, and from that, I just find opportunities come in when you create a great product. Mm -hmm. um, and to what I've had to learn is like before, I wouldn't. I felt uncomfortable talking on stage mm -hmm. oh, okay you know or doing an interview and the thing is it just takes as you know it just takes you got to do it yeah and all of a sudden a week ago Demi brought me on stage in front of 6,000 fans um, in Kansas City I think we were uh, because uh, Nick Jonas and their manager went to Obama's birthday party and so when she was doing a costume change, there was an, uh, a minute of dead time on stage. <laughs> so she like made this incredible introduction to me and, you know, I get, get out on stage and, um, be, again, because I've been such a, you know, in the living room type of person right. and one-on-one, -on -one, um, but the universe creates those opportunities and I've learned to say yes. Mm. That's a great lesson. So let's talk about the tour. Oh, and one more thing. Yeah. What Demi told me, because I asked Demi, I'm like, I'm like, how do you know when you go out and give a talk or go on stage? You know, here's a woman, she's 23, she's been in the business forever. You know, last night there's 15,000 people there for her. Like, how do you know if, you, if you're communicating a good message or if like you feel off? Mm -hmm. And she said, every single time, I make it about the crowd and how do I actually help people have an amazing evening? Mm -hmm. I know I did a good show. If there's some ego in it for me, it's not a good show. And so that's what I've, yeah. when, when you're talking about how do you, I just go, it's not about me. Yeah. So explain how these workshops work. It's so foreign. I mean, even just when I was reading about it, I'm like a wellness workshop before a pop concert. Yeah. Explain how it works. <laughs> so we're in 44 cities. Uh, on this tour, we'll end up on some other tours. At six o'clock in every city, I have a different speaker. So last night I had Meta World Peace. Um, I've had everything from professional athletes to people who have just really um, incredible stories. Like tonight we have Kevin Hines in San Jose. He jumped off the Golden State Bridge and survived uh, trying to kill himself. And to me, that's like, that's such an incredible story of survival and turning your life around. And yeah. now he's a motivational speaker. So for us, it's an opportunity. The thing that I see is I eventually want to have schools, public schools, uh, a course be on self-empowerment, self-awareness. Like that's my long-term goal. Mm, cool. Um, again, I don't know what the business is, but <laughs> <laughs> I, it all comes. Um, because I feel like we, we, kids and like if I even look at my childhood and everyone I've spoken to there's more value put into uh you know uh achievement achievement or 
you go to physical education classes mm. like gym right. PE why aren't we doing like like self-awareness classes yeah great because question. you don't you're born into families without a choice mm. and you're born with certain parents and we all I don't know anyone on earth <laughs> who can't tell you some negative way that their parents have affected <laughs> their life and later in life you go back and you go oh that's why I'm you know mm -hmm. and so um so that's my long-term goal. And the, the way to get there, my belief is I have to make mental health, which mental health is just like physical health. So mm. people go to the gym three days a week for physical health. They should do their mental health three times a week. I think it'll make the world a better place. I think it'll help. I think it'll help everyone get along better countries, yeah. communities. Yeah. Um, and so if I make it mainstream and cool, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, in every city, like last night we had 300 people, a lot of people don't even know what they're showing up for. Oh, you know, funny. they have to buy a ticket to the concert and then they have to sign up for a list. And they know that I mean, there's a good, a, lar a large percent know what they're showing up for, but we'll also hand out some passes to people and say, hey, would you like to come into this? And it is a uplifting, wild hour. Hmm. Uh, Demi and Nick come. They've been to almost every single one of them. Again, like, when I pulled this off, I thought, oh, well, they'll maybe come to one or two. Yeah. They, I mean, they literally have come to almost, they've even asked their friends. Like Nick has called in, uh, he called in Jonathan Tucker, who's an, uh, an actor. Demi's called in different friends. Um, and what it does is it, for the performers, it makes them feel really great before they go out on stage. Yeah. And for the uh, audience, it gets them self-aware in a great space before the concert. So already we've come across 6,000 people. Mm. Um, and it it's just such an awesome opportunity to bring people together to, because you know, like I, I've had people share their stories and then on social media, people are thrilled. Like, you know, we, we, we get so much great feedback. Even the, even the person speaking tonight, Kevin Hines, that came to us from a fan mm. of Demi's. Yeah. So that's how you create a community where it's like, right. oh, this is cool. Oh, I want that guy to speak. I want to come out to that show. And yeah. And uh, I love it. That's really incredible. I mean, when you think about it on paper, I'm sure someone was like, Mike, this is a crazy idea. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's yeah. awesome. So I know you have to fly to meet her today. So I want to wrap up with the last few questions. You work with high achievers you know, you know, really driven people, big dreams, big goals. And that's a lot of my audience. What are some mistakes we're making in not taking care of our mental health? Or what are some patterns you see that we need to look out for? First things first is I always say in the morning. So the whole thing to me is um, how do we start our day? Okay. So if you start your day looking at your phone and your text messages, you're probably going to get anxiety. <laughs> What? I don't know how many people first thing in the morning open up their phone and they're like, oh, <laughs> life is so good. Life is so good. So what I would suggest is you find a place in your house that you love. Hopefully you love somewhere in your house or a hotel room or uh, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. Find that spot in your house and start to build a structure. Okay. Sit in that spot in your house and start to appreciate your life. Appreciate yourself. Everyone I talk to, unless they're really working on themselves, um, digest more negative information in a day than positive about themselves. Mm. It's less about what they're doing right, more about what they're doing wrong. Right. So unless we fuel our system with um, the right voices, the right messaging, we're kind of running on empty. Yeah. We're running on ego. So that would be one thing I would suggest is how you start your day. Mm -hmm. And then the other is how you end your day. So ending your day is... What you appreciate about yourself today? You know, there's this thing in like society around self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad thing. Self-centeredness mm -hmm. is a great thing because if you take care of yourself, you make the world a better place. You take care of other people. Yeah. Now, if you're doing things for yourself that don't help other people, I think that could be a negative twist to it. To me, it's about like filling up our spirits and our lives with love. I love that. So looking over this journey, you know, in, you start as a solo, you know, 
a coach and therapist or interventionist. Now you have so many employees, you're on tour. What's been the best thing and the worst thing about that entrepreneurial journey? Oh gosh, the best thing about the entrepreneurial journey is you never know where it's gonna end up. Mm. And I love that. I love change, <laughs> I love fast pace, I love high energy. Yeah. Uh, the worst thing about it is not knowing where you're going. <laughs> so right. you know, it's like greatest strength, greatest weakness, but right. um but you know, or I think the hardest part is if there's moments of feeling really alone. So mm -hmm. I always say that's why it's good to have a coach, a mentor, a support system mm -hmm. um, that really makes you the best version of yourself. Yeah. Have you had mentors along the oh, way? Oh, yeah. Who, who are some mentors in your life? I mean, it, it changes. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, I mean, you want names or? Or just stories or, yeah. Yeah, like I'll go away once a year uh, to another country where they don't speak English. Okay. This is something I do, is I go to a country where they don't speak English, and first of all, I do that alone okay. for like five days. Okay. And what I try to do is I try, I just, I try to experience life at a very like uh, curious place. Mm -hmm. I don't even look at where I'm supposed to go. Wow. Yeah. And what happens is I'm able to see what's going on in my brain. Okay. The first few days, I'm like, oh my gosh, my life is so good. I. I love life, you know, oh, this is, this is so great. Look at look at what I can do. And then by day three, I'm like, their Wi-Fi sucks. This yeah. ain't a five-star hotel. Right. You know, these sheets are terrible. <laughs> and then I have to go back and be like, oh, what is my brain doing? But wow. usually I'll, I'll fly someone out to work with me. Or um, like I flew someone out to work with me in Greece who's based out of London. So a coach for you? Mm -hmm. Someone to help you? Yeah, I think I think uh, I have a coach right now. He's meeting me in San Jose. Awesome. Yeah, and he's helped me with um, mantras before I start speaking. Yeah. Which is really helpful. So I think um, everyone has blind spots. Mm. And if you don't have a coach, from my experience or a mentor, you're going to get into a car accident at some point. Right. Wow, that's great advice. So lastly, for that someone out there who wants to do what you've done um, in mental health or just in helping people, maybe they're a coach or consultant, What's your number one piece of advice for them to become successful? To be a coach? Um, yeah. Um, and to grow like you have. Figure out your art mm. is the number one thing I would say. I think we are all artists. Everyone. Mm. And I work with massive pop stars. And I can tell you, uh, everyone's an artist. And... It requires being honest with self. And usually, to me, it's it's spiritual moments is art. Mm. It's pure. When mm. we feel the most free and connected. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, it's understanding what your art is. And not... Um, and understanding... And the other... So, that's number one. <laughs> the second piece mm -hmm. is not to project. Mm. Projection is... Uh, if you're wanting to be a coach or you're, you know, from my experience, it's not a, you, you have to be aware of what's going on inside of yourself. Mm. And make sure you're not putting that on your client. Yeah. And it could be so nicely intended. Like, oh, this woman really needs um, me to show up because no one ever loved her as a kid. You know, let's, <laughs> let's, whatever the example is. Right. But a better solution may be um, her coming to you. Hmm. Not rescuing her. Oh, I see. I see. And figuring out, like, it's again, it's just figuring out the right strategy. Mm -hmm. That's probably not. That's not the best example, <laughs> but um, I would say live in your art and, and and not project. Man, there is so much we can learn from that interview. But here are my keys to success from my interview with Mike Bayer. Number one, clean your slate. If you want to be an effective life coach, therapist, counselor, or even a mentor, Bayer says you need to make sure you know what's going on inside yourself first to make sure you're not projecting your own issues onto your client and instead finding the best solution for them. Number two, trust your gut. Clearly, if he's traveling the world as a sober companion with someone 24-7 or doing pre-concert seminars, he has his own way of doing things. And along the way, he had to learn to trust his instincts, which definitely paid off. Number three, learn your industry. 
When he started as an interventionist, he was a young guy and everyone else was older and doing things the way that they'd always been done. So he decided to learn the rules in order to break them. Number four, become a resource. He has a strict policy to work with people he loves, which means if he doesn't have the right chemistry with a client or if he believes that he and his staff can't give them the proper help that they need, he will let them go. He doesn't believe in treating everyone and instead he will refer them to who they need, which made him become a resource and a connector within the industry that everyone trusted. Number five, build yourself. Bayer still hires a coach for himself and will travel the world on his own to unplug and tap into his emotional and mental habits. This is a common trait among many of the successful people I interview. Even at the top of their game, they still seek out help from mentors and coaches. Number six, expand your vision. Did Bayer see himself on tour with pop stars doing wellness seminars? Of course not, but he decided to stay flexible and saw the opportunities that other people in the industry missed. And lastly, number seven, build your brand. Now, when people hear build your brand, they think get exposure, build your following, get press, but I'm talking about the opposite. Bayer built his brand behind the scenes, serving his clients, working with Demi Lovato for over five years before she finally convinced him to come into the spotlight and start talking about his work. Lovato and Bayer both agree that the key is to remember it's about the client, it's about the customer, it's about the fan. It's not about us. Well, thank you so much for taking time to let us invade your home. Thank before you. you fly out. This has been awesome. I'm Kelsey Humphreys here with Mike Bayer. You can check him out at castcenters.com, right? Yes. And this has been The Pursuit. Don't forget, guys, there are three ways to support the show. You can subscribe here on YouTube, you can leave a comment, and you can go subscribe to the weekly emails to go behind the scenes and get extra info from each episode.